not afraid to let go uh. You decide if you're ever gonna let me know Yeah, suicide if you ever try to let go uh. I'm sad and know, yeah I'm sad and know, yeah Who am I? Someone not afraid to let go uh. You decide if you're ever gonna let me know all right guys, so it's Arlie and I'm here with another video. We're checking out, is God of War doomed for Ragnarok Culture Shock? Um, it's game theory, you guys know I'm a huge fan of game theory. If you guys are gamers, you should subscribe to my channel because of course I will have more game theory videos coming out and I will be doing game live streams and stuff like that in June. Um, and I will be doing a walkthrough for God of War. I hope you guys stick around to watch that. So go ahead and subscribe, click on that bell. Let's get to work. This video is sponsored by God of War. Click the link in the description below for even more information about Kratos and his son Atreus' adventure into the mystic world of the Norse. Hey everyone, Gaijin Goomba here. Dude, the next God of War is just a week away. Well, of course I'm excited! This is one of the few definitive franchises that takes old pantheons from ancient culture and spins them into fascinating original stories. And as the series moves into a brand new Norse setting, how could I not cover the fantastic folklore around it? Besides, the way that Kratos has changed and evolved in this new setting is something I've been wanting to see for a while now. He's not fighting alone anymore, but instead working closely with his son, Atreus, who complements Kratos' hand-to-hand style combat with ranged support using his lightning arrows. The two work in tandem not only in combat, but also in puzzles and narrative. Personally, I love the fact that Kratos has moved to a character with depth and purpose. You can tell he wants to be a good father and a good person, yet- You know, I'm happy that they did this to Kratos too, because honestly, playing the past three games, I mean, you understand his motive, but he really had no extra depth. I mean, you know his family. I mean, that was, I mean, that could have some emotional atonement, but really it fell so flat. But what made up for it was just his sheer style and getting his revenge. That's what made the past three games so popular. It's like, okay, this guy doesn't have much of a personality, but we know why he's going after these people and he is doing it in style. I mean, he's crushing heads. He's breaking the bones. He's slicing intestines out. He's tearing heads off. Like this guy, he's cutting arms off. He's crushing fingers. Like he is going bloody. Like you know what I mean? Like he's going hard. Like that's what God of War is known for. And that probably won't go away in the new game, but at least he'll be he'll be a fleshed out character. He'll be a more developed God of War. He'll be a more developed Kratos. And that's cool, you know, that's cool. And this new setting for Norse mythology, his son, and like just the overall story, it's, it's cool, it's cool, man. It's really, really dope, and I, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm gonna go get the game day one. Let's get it. And who he is is something he actively struggles with. So far in what I've seen in the game, Kratos may end up relying just as much on his son's humanity as Atreus relies on his father to guide him as a warrior. So when PlayStation came to me wanting to sponsor a video analyzing the game, of course I jumped at it. The question just becomes, what in this gigantic world of 13th century Iceland folklore do I talk about? Kratos' new weapon, the Leviathan Axe, could be cool. I mean, while the weapon itself is unique to the game, its creators Brock and Sentry are legendary dwarves as cited in the Prose Edda, basically Norse's catalog of ancient history and folklore. The two made all kinds of weapons, armor, and jewelry for the gods including Odin's golden ring Dropnir and Thor's legendary hammer Molnir. But then there's also a whole new pantheon that the game could explore with fantastic gods like Mimir. You call me Mimir, smartest man alive. Yeah, I think Mimir might actually be selling himself a little short here. While historians aren't sure if he was a god or a giant, we do know that he lived up to his namesake, meaning the Rememberer or the Wise One. He was the keeper of the Well of Urd, the great body of water that nourishes the world tree Yggdrasil and determines the past, present, and future for all of existence. In one story, Odin himself gave up an eye to Mimir to drink from the well to gain wisdom, while in another tale, Mimir so, was So, okay, Norse mythology, that means, you know, Ragnarok, the realms, all of that is in this. This is all in that, in this, that's cool, so... There's a possibility of Thor. I don't know if it's gonna he's gonna be in this game. I don't even know if they're gonna make a sequel to the new reboot of God of War. If they do make a sequel, I'll put my bet on it. It's probably gonna be on a next-gen console 
or very at the end of this cycle but i heard this kind of is close to the end of the cycle we know that if last of us 2 is coming out you can pretty much bet it's towards the end of the game cycle the uh, ps4 console cycle the aesir war and a severed head was returned to odin who preserved and gained knowledge from it i guess that's why mimir and god of war wasn't too shaken up at the concept of decapitation first you need to cut off my head wait what but I think the coolest thing this game has to offer are monsters. Just like the God of War games of old, the most unique and creative aspects of the series are the endless varieties of folklore terrors Kratos has to battle his way through. And Norse has plenty of terrifying monsters to go around. Take for example the humble from that horrifying jogger. In concept they may look like any other undead, but these guys make zombies look as threatening as a two month old steak left out in the sun. Draugr, literally meaning a genwalker, are dark blue reanimated corpses of those who were improperly buried by Norse standards. Any body now placed to rest horizontally and feet pinned to the floor became Draugr, wreaking havoc on the living. Yo. Though God of War's Lost Pages holds a slightly different interpretation than that of the Prosetta. But based on the Prosetta, not only did they retain their skills and battle prowess that they had in life, but gain a whole new host of nightmarish powers. The most terrifying of which is the innate ability to grow several times their normal size, towering upwards of 14 to 20 feet tall and crushing their enemies beneath their feet, their preferred way of dispatching their foes. But that's only one of several powers. Draugr could also haunt the dreams of the living, curse them with bad luck, and even use that power to put them to death. In one example, the Gretis Saga, the main protagonist Gretir fights and successfully defeats a Draugr named Glamir. But in the monster's death throes, curses Gretir with misfortune for the remainder of the tale. Finally, if you think you're safe from Draugr out at sea, you would be terribly wrong. Souls that drown at sea almost always return as an even more terrifying Draugr, half-rotting flesh and half-seaweed. Many Nords who lived to a ripe old age would claim that they would see ships filled with Draugr husks sailing vessels made of their own corpses. Seems like Kratos would have his hands full with these seemingly unstoppable undead. But the prose edit does state a way to dispose of a Draugr. Though it takes the blood of a hero, someone of great courage and strength, and well Kratos has all of that in spades so that's one requirement down. A hero would first have to decapitate the Draugr and quickly burn its body to ash. Only after dumping the ashes into the sea will the Draugr never return to life. Given that we've seen the handfuls of fights between Kratos and the Draugr, we can actually see this happening in game. Each fight Kratos has with the Draugr ends with it in cinders burning to ash. Trolls are another monstrosity that Kratos and Atreus come across in their journey. However, I found it very curious that the two only did battle with a single troll in the trailer. Because unlike many other European interpretations that depict trolls as being hideaway loners, Norse trolls are actually very family oriented dwelling together in groups of fathers, mothers, sisters, and brothers who will typically live in isolated caves or dense forests to keep them away from humanity. Cause, boy do they hate humanity. In fact, the Prozetta actually cites a conversation with a female troll confronting and threatening a poet named Bragni Bodison in the book known as Skull Skaparmon. They call me a troll, moon of the hearth Hrungnir, wealth sucker of the giant, destroyer of the storm sun, guardian of the Nafjord, swallower of the wheel of heaven, What's a troll, if not that? And Bragni would have good reason to fear these trolls, as they not only possess insane strength, but command the elements as well. Whereas the more stupid trolls would simply uproot trees as clubs or toss boulders like a catapult, more intelligent trolls could command nature, causing earthquakes, raging thunderstorms, and hurricane-like winds. That's why in retrospect it doesn't seem so out of the ordinary that the troll Kratos and Atreus fought commanded fire while trying to bash the two in with a massive stone. But I tell you what, out of all the creatures that Kratos and Atreus could Dude, have Dude, can I just say this game looks amazing? And it's cool that they, they've taken Norse mythology and taken all its monsters and lore and put it into a game. That Now, that's cool. Cross, the last one I would have expected them to run into would be the world serpent Jormungand. And no, I'm not confusing the trailer with some random sea monster. Atreus calls it by name. The world serpent. The world serpent. Lucky that it wants to aid them because Jormungand is absolutely no creature to take lightly. According to the prose Edda, Jormungand was the offspring of Loki and a giantess named Angerbolda. One of three siblings, actually. The other two being Fenrir, the father of wolves prophesied to slay Odin in the Battle of Ragnarok, and Hel, the appointed ruler of the miserable underworld that houses the souls of those who died from sickness and old age, never to see the splendor of Valhalla. And much like his siblings, Jormungand is also a doomsday monster of the Norns. As he did for the rest of Loki's children, Odin banished Jormungand to, quote, that deep sea that lies around all lands. 
There it grew from the size of an above average snake into a serpent so massive it encircled the entire world, which is why it bears the name Midgard or World Serpent. To this day, it's believed that Jormungand continues to lay dormant with its tail in its mouth. But when it finally releases its tail from its teeth, the end times, Ragnarok, will begin. As the battle between Giant and God unfolds, it's foretold that Thor and Jormungand will square off in a one-on-one -on -one fight, with Thor being the victor, but will have taken no more than nine steps away from the fight before he succumbs to Jormungand's poison. So, yeah, definitely a creature you don't want to mess with. I really can't draw any hard conclusions about what we see with Jormungand interacting with Kratos and Atreus, but one thing's for certain. If whatever's happening in-game really does cause Jormungand to release his tail and go to surface from above the deep sea, something big's gonna go down in the story. And that's what I think I'm really looking forward to most with this game. The story. The combat looks and feels just as good as it ever has, but watching Kratos growing as a person, as a hero, and as a father is something I've very much been looking forward to for a while now. That's what I've been looking forward to. Like, I think that them putting him in this new setting will really grow Kratos. Just He will be such a more developed character. And this, this game has already got me like, I am so hyped. I don't think you guys understand how hype I am for this game. I am hype. And if God of War continues its tradition of masterfully integrating characters into ancient lore in this game, there's going to be one heck of a saga to unfurl. But thanks for watching, everyone, and another big thanks to Sony and God of War for sponsoring this video. If you want to learn more about the game and the ancient Norse culture that it stems from, check out the link in the description. Otherwise, the game comes out April 20th, so you can see for yourself just how deep into the lore God of War goes. And as always, if you love theory... That is dope, that is dope. Alright guys, make sure you subscribe. As always, I will be making uh, a God of War walkthrough. I will be doing a review also, and thanks so much for watching, and peace.